Hi, and welcome to another lecture with Marine Biology at Home. Before we get started, don't forget to check out our Facebook page for extra tidbits that you wouldn't find in our lectures. And remember that we have a YouTube channel, so please like and subscribe to at Biology at Home to find all of our content in one place. And remember, when you subscribe, you'll stay up to date on when new lectures drop. So, who is talking right now? Hi everyone, my name is Emma Tovar and I work as a staff research associate at Scripps Institution of Oceanography out here in sunny San Diego, California. And the lab that I work in focuses on zooplankton research and my job mostly surrounds cataloging samples that we've collected from various research cruises. And I've been here for about just a little over four years now and I have to say I have definitely learned a lot from the various grad students who have come and gone throughout Scripps and in our lab and it's just been a good experience overall. Now if you have any questions about this lecture or would like to learn more about Scripps in general please don't hesitate to send me an email and I have it down here below and I look forward to hearing from you. As I said before, um, our lab focuses on zooplankton, so naturally, today's lecture is going to be focusing on these awesome marine organisms. Um, this lecture will be a brief introduction into zooplankton and the many ways that people have been studying these tiny little organisms. Um, I'll be going through habitat, diet, size classification, basic taxonomy, and migration patterns to help give um, everyone a better picture of why zooplankton are an important part of the marine food web. And to round out our lecture today, I actually also want to spotlight some of the cool research that has been done to help everyone better understand zooplankton and their role within the oceans. All right, so by this point, I think I have said zooplankton enough times, right? So I'm gonna say it a couple more, unfortunately, so bear with me. Um, today, we're gonna to focus specifically on marine zooplankton. There are freshwater zooplankton, and there are very, uh, lots of similarities between the two, but for today, we're gonna to just focus on the marine guys. And so zooplankton are planktonic animals that can live at all depths of the ocean. The word zooplankton actually is derived from the Greek word zoon, meaning animal, and planktos, <clears throat> meaning to wander or drift. So when you combine the two, what you get are wandering or drifting animals, which pretty much sums up zooplankton. Um, this is one of those random tidbits that you might want to remember because you never know when it might be handy for one of your Zoom trivia nights. Many might assume that zooplankton might consist of a diet of just eating other types of zooplankton. And while this is definitely one way to gather nutrients, zooplankton have evolved many different strategies in order to eat and to survive. And so and one of those is to actually be herbivores or herbivorous and feed primarily, excuse me, on phytoplankton. Um, another one which you're familiar with is carnivores or to be carnivorous. And carnivorous zooplankton feed on other types of zooplankton, so other animals. And then we have zooplankton that are Detritivores, or they eat primarily detritus, which is the dead organic matter um, that we can, it usually will fall throughout the water column. And then we have zooplankton that will also be omnivorous. And so they feed on a mixed diet of plants and animals and detritus. So probably one of the least picky eaters out there. So kudos to them, I suppose. And then lastly, we have our mixotrophs. And so these are very interesting um, organisms in that they can eat other zooplankton and also photosynthesize. And so examples of mixotrophs might include ciliates or rhizaria, and they're mixotrophic um, owing to their ability to retain functional algal organelles 
or maintenance of their algal endosymbionts. And so um, there's just, when you think about how zooplankton are able to eat and survive, there's just a lot of different ways that they are able to do that. All right, so all of zooplankton can fall into one of two categories. Either they are holoplankton or they are meroplankton. And so holoplankton, let me go on here. There we go. Holoplankton are types of plankton that will stay in the planktonic state their whole lives and they will drift and drift and drift throughout the epimesopelagic pelagic zones. And um, I will expand a little bit more on that later. And so holoplankton, as you can see here in this image, uh, there's many different types. There's lots of different types of holoplankton and they can range in size from a few micrometers um, to very, very large, uh, we're talking maybe uh, cnidarians like jellies or siphonophores. And so holoplankton are very important because they serve as a uh, vital food source for large organisms like fish or baleen whales. Um, when you think of whales, you might think of like um, a humpback whale or something. And an example, I want to show you some, I just want to highlight some of the different types of plankton that I have seen in the samples that I work with. So it can vary between, let me get my pen, it can vary between copepods, or between, I've seen doliolids in our samples, definitely seen Um oh, I've definitely seen salps. Some years we've had lots and lots of salps in our samples. Um, I've seen siphonophores pretty often, the same goes for appendicularians. And again, you can see just from this image that there are many different types of zooplankton that are holoplankton and they will stay um, very small their whole lives. And so let me go ahead and erase my doodles here. Okay, so go ahead and move on to the next one. So the second category that we were talking about are meroplankton. And so meroplankton are types of plankton that um, will only stay plankton for a part of their lives. And so typically that would mean the early stages of development for these different organisms. And so they start off in the planktonic state as nauplii, but then as they mature um, and become larger, they will settle in different parts of the ocean. And a lot of these you probably have seen before, um, whether it's at the beach or whether it was at an aquarium. Um, all of these organisms you see here, they, they all had to start off pretty small. And so a common example we might see, pen, um, would be the common sea star, although right here it says starfish, that's not what we're supposed to say. Um, another one we might see a lot at the beach um, would be crabs. Here we have the green crab. If you have been to an aquarium recently, you may have had the chance to see an octopus. And so all of these organisms had to start off um, as noplii in the planktonic state, and then over time they grew and matured into the organisms you see below. And so these different categories, holoplankton and, and meroplankton, um, it helps us to be able to better understand the size, different size classifications for the different types of zooplankton and why some stay in the planktonic state and why others mature and grow and become larger. All right, so zooplankton can also be categorized based um, by size. And so what we have at this table um, are four different size classes. Uh, before we jump into this table, I want to also talk about a smaller and even smaller size class called nanoplankton. And um, they're unicellular animals that feed on phytoplankton and are then eaten by other types of zooplankton. And their size range can vary from 2 to 20 micrometers, and we see an example of that here. And with these images, in order to be taken, they probably had to use a microscope because my nano zooplankton are so small. And so now, jumping back to the table, we start with microzooplankton, and their size ranges from 20 to 200 micrometers. And different types of organisms that can be represented here would be different stages of copepod. 
And um, if we take a look at the bottom of this picture, the bottom row, G and H are good examples of two different types of copepod in the Nauplii stage. And then if we take a look at I here in the bottom right corner, this looks like um, some type of um, bivalve Nauplii in its early stages of development. And so these are pretty good examples to look towards when um, thinking about the size and what, what microzooplankton might look like. And then let's go ahead and delete our doodles. And moving on. OK, so mesozooplankton, um, they range from 0.2 to 20 millimeters. So we're going up in size a little bit. And different types of organisms within this category can be amphipods, appendicularians, ketognaths, and copepods, or doliolids and selps. And um, with these, with organisms in this size class, you can see that this, the the body type ch can change dramatically. And so again, we have different types of copepod here. We have what looks like some sort of marine worm. Um, we have a ketognath here, a euphalzid here. So many different shapes, sizes, uh, all included in the um, in the mesozooplankton category. And then go ahead, erase, erase. OK, and moving on. So the next one we have are macrozooplankton. And macrozooplankton, their stage or their size can range from 20 to 200 millimeters. So they're getting much bigger. And organisms in this category can include euphausids, heteropods, jellyfish, larval fish, mycids, pteropods, and solitary salps. And so um, what we have an image here on the right is an example of a pteropod called um, Limacina helicina. And you can tell here that part of its shell actually has been damaged. And this probably occurred when it was being collected through the net or something. And so because these shells are very delicate, um, they're not used to being handled roughly or being tossed around by current, a strong current, because they live at a lower depth in the water column. Um, but you can see that the shell should have extended a little bit further down here. Um, but this is a nice example of what a macrozooplankton might look like. And so then lastly, we'll go to our megazooplankton. Um, they are pretty much organisms that are greater than 200 millimeters and that can include jellyfish and colonial salps. And um, in this image here, we have a, a good example, which is called the Portuguese man of war, um, which is probably a very popular image or, or organisms that we have probably seen in textbooks or on TV and such. And then another example that we have are the wind, um, or I'm sorry, by the wind sailor, or Valella Valella. And these I have seen wash up ashore in San Diego, and um, it, and they've washed up by the tens of thousands. And when they dry up, they just look like little pieces of blue plastic wrap. Um, and they just kind of fly away with the breeze when they dry up. And so, uh, but they wash ashore because they um, use this part of their uh, body uh, like a sail and are propelled along the top of the ocean or the surface of the ocean um, from the wind or by the wind. And so when they wash up ashore, they can't help it and uh, they just eventually dry up. But these are also good examples of types of megazooplankton. Right, so there are many species of zooplankton that live in the euphotic or on this diagram we have the photic zone of the ocean and so what that means is that they live at depths at which sunlight can penetrate and feeding on phytoplankton and phytoplankton are restricted to a specific part of the ocean because they photosynthesize and in order to photosynthesize they need sunlight and so in the photic zone we see that um, that zone is not very deep. We're looking at just right here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
And in the marine ecosystem, um, the photic zone can range in, um, in depth between maybe roughly 30 meters when you're looking more uh, coastal or inland, um, or when you are further out in the ocean, the photic zone can extend between 100 and 200 meters out um, in depth. And so um, uh, many different types of zooplankton will live and thrive within the photic zone. However, zooplankton do live and exist in different parts of the water column and not specifically just the photic zone. And what we'll actually learn a little bit later, um, one of our grad students in the lab that I work in are studying zooplankton that uh, live and thrive in the, use my pen again, in the mesopelagic zone. And so there are zooplankton that live down there. And so <clears throat> um, when you look at the vertical distribution of the zooplankton and where they live, um, many variables go into play on to why they exist at different depths in the water column. And food availability is a key factor along with oxygen, saturation, um, is another one, um, the amount of light, sunlight available is another one. And so um, in turbulence and nutrients, the amount of nutrients available are others. And so there's many different reasons why zooplankton will exist at various depths within the water column. And, and this is a, and could be a really great lecture to expand on later, if someone wanted to. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about taxonomy and the different phylums and subphylums of zooplankton. In the next couple of slides, I'll talk about these different groups and show a few examples of what they would look like and um, examples of the size that they can reach. And so the different groups I will be talking about today include crustaceans, nadarians, tenophores, aka comb jellies, uricordates, salps, and larvaceae. Worms could be arrowworms or polychaetes, pteropods, which are planktonic snails, and protists. All right, so first up are crustaceans. And crustaceans, they have an external chitin skeleton. And uh, the word chitin might be familiar for some of you who are bug enthusiasts because insects uh, use chitin to create the exoskeleton that they need in order to protect the insides. Um, and then crustaceans also have segmentation that runs along their body. The image here on the right, you can see uh, really nicely the segmentation along the, the tail. And um, the segmentation allows for the copepods and krill, um, amphipods to be able to bend and move around in the water. Um, they also consist of paired jointed appendages, so the legs and the antennae. And along with the antennae are mandibles and maxillae that um, are part of the head appendages. So the maxillae, they serve to transport food uh, to the mandible, but also assist in the filtration, water filtration, and sometimes also play a role in cleaning and grooming. And so crustaceans have a simple nopplier, in some cases compound eyes, and these eyes help with uh, sensing where the direction of where the sunlight is coming from. And crustaceans include copepods, krill, and amphipods, which are crabs and lobsters. Next. So one group of crustaceans we'll look at are copepods, and they are the largest group of crustaceans in the zooplankton world, and the range of size is around less uh, than a millimeter to around a few millimeters long. And so planktonic forms belong to the order of Calanoida, which I see very often in the samples that I scan. They have a long pair of antennae, um, which you can see on the image here, and they're very beautiful. They swim mainly with the aid of five pairs of thoracic appendages, and they lack compound eyes. And so they actually have medial nopplier eyes. And so what this means, if you look here, this is a good example. Um, the medial nopular eyes um, are a simple uh, type of eye that consists of three photoreceptor units. And 
these units help the copepod be able to tell the direction of where the light is coming from. So again, sunlight. Um, and they feed on phytoplankton or smaller zooplankton, depending on the species. But from what we knew about their diet earlier, they can be omnivorous, herbivorous, or carnivorous. And then next group are krill. And so krill are shrimp-like. We probably have seen these a lot. And if you've seen any nature documentaries or like planet Earth and stuff, you've probably seen those giant swarms of krill in the ocean and the majestic baleen whale jumping through, swimming through the ocean to gobble up all of the krill, right? So krill are a very important food source for many animals in the ocean. And they are abundant in the Antarctic and an upwelling region. So this is also a main reason why many large marine animals will migrate to the Antarctic or, or to colder regions because they're looking for this krill to eat. And so again, they're the main food of baleen whales in the Antarctic. Um, krill feed on phytoplankton and other types of zooplankton. And they feed by means of a group of appendages uh, that form a basket. And so these appendages um, will help them move and filter water towards their mandibles so that they can quickly feed um, in a small, a small space around them versus having to venture out far, swim further to find their prey. They just kind of swoop in and draw the water in and filter and um, draw the in water into their mandibles to feed. Okay, so what I wanted to show you quickly was a video of a particular type of copepod. It's called Metridia longa. And in this video, what's happening is that, um, and it's a slow-mo, which is good because you really get to see it in action. Um, it detects the phytoplankton. And you should see it coming up just right here. So what happens after it detects the phytoplankton is that it triggers what's called a, um, an attack response. And so the copepod, what it's going to do is it creates a suction to draw in. You can see it's using all of its appendages to draw in water and phytoplankton um, in its mouth to feed. And so a single copepod can consume up to three 373,000 phytoplanktons per day, and they generally have to clear the equivalent to about a million times their own body volume of water every day to cover just their tr nutritional needs. And when you think about how much time that takes and what that process would look like, it is pretty pretty crazy. Um, just imagining how humans would have to sustain themselves if we had to do that would be <laughs> a lot of food. And so copepods spend a lot of their time feeding and trying to find food. And so they, um, because they are drifters and they are not able to move around, say, like a fish would in order to find its food, it has to really utilize um, immediately what's surrounding them. And so any ad advantage um, to be able to detect phytoplankton or other types of zooplankton and quickly grab and eat them, it would be advantageous to their survival. All right, cnidarians. So cnidarians um, are, there are more than 9,000 living species in this group and um, they inhabit all marine and some fr freshwater environments and um, these organisms are most abundant, though, and diverse. You'll see a lot of diversity in tropical waters. And uh, cnidarians are radially symmetrical, so similar parts are arranged symmetrically around a, um, a central disc. And they lack cephalization or like a concentration of sensory, sensory organs in the head. Um, we'd say maybe like the bell of like a jellyfish, for example. And um, with cnidarians, their bodies have two cell layers rather than three. And all cnidarians have what's called nematocysts, which are long, thin, coiled stingers almost, like barbs. And they can, uh, these barbs inject uh, their prey or some, you know, helpless swimmer or surfer with, uh, with venom. And so these tiny darts are propelled out of a special cell and they're used to attack 
or defend itself from animals larger than itself or to catch its next dinner. And so cnidarians can be broken down into four major groups. Um, anthrozoa, which includes true corals, anemones, and sea pens. You have cubozoa, um, the amazing box jellyfish are one, or box jellies, excuse me, and um, next you have hydrozoa. They're the most diverse group within siphonophores, hydroids, uh, fire corals, and many different types of medusae. And then you have the siphozoas, or the true jellyfish, and many nadarians uh, are mostly carnivorous, um, and again, they use nematocysts or stinging cells to catch and grab their prey. And um, these are probably some of the most familiar for a lot of people when they think of the ocean or visiting the aquarium, they'll think, oh, I want to see the jellyfish, I want to see the jellyfish. And so um, a lot of us have experience at least visiting and seeing these in aquariums, and maybe some of us have experience being stung by a couple of these guys. So tinafores, um, they are, boop, microcarnivores. They like to feed on smaller zooplankton and planktonic eggs and invertebrate larvae. Uh, they have eight rows of meridional plates, and some have two long tentacles. And so these comb rows are few cilia that are arranged along the sides, again, of the tinafore, and they're clearly visible like we can see in the image um, on the right. And the cilia, they beat together in, in, in unison and propel, it helps propel the tinafore in the water. And some species of tinafore will actually um, move with a flapping motion um, or like undulations of the body. And um, yes, many, te uh, many tinafores can have two long tentacles um, on their body, but some also just lack tentacles completely. And unlike nadarians, which have um, stinging cells or nematocysts, um, tinafores do not. Instead, they possess sticky cells called coloblasts to catch and to hold on to their prey. And one of the most interesting um, things about tinafores is that they have, they're able to um, produce this light, light scattering effect by beating the eight rows of cilia on their body. And this when you when they when you see the cilia moving, it appears like a almost like um, a rainbow, a transition of color, and it's really beautiful. And I um, will show you in the, in the next slide a video of this. And um, and most people assume that with tinafores that um, bioluminescence is also the same rainbow effect that you might see, but actually the colors that you will typically see with bioluminescence um, would be green and blue. And so not all tinafores can um, produce bioluminescence, but um, when you do see bioluminescence occurring in tinafores, it can only occur in um, pitch black or in darkness. And so, let's see, in the next video I just want to show uh, a good example of what the tinafores look like when they are beating the cilia, and you can see this rainbow of color effect happening here. Um, yes, yeah, so you can see it running all along down here on this one. I'm going to see if I can. Ah, yes, there we go. And you get a much better up close look on what that process looks like. And when you see these up close, um, they are moving so quickly and they look very beautiful in their environment and in most aquariums when they're trying to display tinafores they will try to display them in a darker tank or a tank that has less light so that you really can see the different colors that are on uh, the tinafores so this is a, a nice video to showcase and highlight that
All right, so up next we have Eurochordates, which will include Salps and Lavoisier. Click. <laughs> and so Salps, um, they're typically barrel like in form and they are filter filled feeders, excuse me, and they move by contracting or pumping water through their body, so in order to propel them through the water. And they can be seen typically at the surface as a single salp, or you can see them in these massive, massive colonies. And so their most abundant concentrations can, of salps um, are typically found within the Southern Ocean near Antarctica. And we've seen a lot of these salps of salps um, in our samples within the last couple of years. And um, this is noteworthy because typically we don't see salps this far north, especially along in San Diego or near San Diego. And so um, there's been a lot of interest recently on um, why this is and how this will affect uh, local uh, zooplankton populations um, in the future. And so next we have Larvaceae, and so they are from the group Chordata, and they live in gelatinous balloons or what we call houses. And um, the Larvaceae could also be called appendicularians, and they will periodically leave or abandon their house in order to feed. And so um, they are mostly transparent and they are filter feeders and they do eat um, other types of plankton or zooplankton and so the house uh, portion of where of the appendicular appendicular excuse me or larvaceae um, is characterized by two openings and they're located on opposite ends of the the structure of the house and they enclose the trunk and the body. And so with the Lavarsian, they can propel the house forward um, through the water by beating its tail. And by beating its tail, it produces um, a current that pretty much pulls the water through and then forward, or through the opening, excuse me, of the house. And then it pushes the uh, water back out through the back end of the house. And so what this does is it allows for uh, the microscopic food particles um, to pass through and become captured. Um, and then it allows for the Lavarsian to eat and, um, and then move on. And basically what happens is that these organisms will consistently create and abandon houses several times each day. And this is important because these empty houses uh, provide valuable carbon source for oceans and to help produce marine snow that other types of zooplankton at lower depths in the, um, in the water column feed on for their source of food and nutrition. So these Lavarciers are pretty cool and um, not much footage is recorded on their feeding behavior. So it's always really neat when we do have that footage to observe how they react in their natural environment. For this next slide, we're gonna be talking about worms, which will include ketignaths and polychaetes. And so with ketignaths, um, this image, by the way, is so cool. Um, they are also known as arrow worms, and they can be found in open waters of pretty much every ocean. And they range from around 0.2 to 12 centimeters in length, and they have a slender, transparent body with one or two pairs of fins. And so their head is rounded, as you can see in this picture, and armed with, on each side, a group of grasping spines, and they use these spines to hunt primarily on copepods. Um, and so they rely on the tufts of these tiny hairs, and you can kind of see it in this picture here, on their head to recognize the vibrations produced by, uh, by their prey. And so what the ketignaths will do is they'll use this, uh, the hairs and, and actually snatch up the prey. And they, like I said, primarily feed on copepods, but they will also eat amphipods and ostracods and other 
or types of worms like polychaetes and other types of planktonic tunicates as well, and sometimes to fish larvae. Um, and what's really cool about this image is that you can see their teeth, and they use um, their teeth to also capture their prey. And what's really interesting about um, ketignaths, excuse me, is that uh, even when I, I have seen these um, in my samples, you can e so easily see their the head and the spines and the and the jaw pretty much of these keating gnats, and they truly look like carnivorous zooplankton, and they're ready to eat other types of zooplankton. And then the next types of worm again are polychaetes and these guys are segmented worms and they're among the most common marine organisms that we can find out there and they can be found living in depths of the ocean or you can find them near the surface and a lot of the time if you went tide pooling or out on the mud flats you would see them burying their bodies into the sand or mud at the beach and they usually have a well-developed head and often um, have are complete with well-developed eyes, antennae, and sensory palps because a lot of the times these polychaetes can be out of the water as well. So they need to have more developed uh, organs and sensory or sensory organs to be able to detect light and oxygen um, when they're out of the water. All right, so pteropods <clears throat> or planktonic snails. They are specialized free-swimming pelagic sea snails and slugs, and they are characterized by a foot that has been modified to form a pair of wing-like flaps or parapodia that allow them to actually swim within the water column. And they can actually be quite graceful when we find them out in the ocean, and most live in the top 10 meters of the ocean, and they're pretty small, so they're less than about a centimeter in length. And <clears throat> pteropods include two different groups, uh, Thecosomata, or uh, the sea butterflies, or not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Gymnosomata, the sea angels. And um, Thecosomata, they, uh, the sea butterflies, they produce a net of sticky mucus to passively collect and eat marine snow. And so this is a great method to maximize the amount of energy that you're using by creating just like a big net to do the work for you versus trying to actively go out and hunt. Whereas with Gymnosomata, they do the opposite and they are active predators and they will go out and snatch up prey um, using these um, appendages that look like um, almost like a jaw of some sort and they will pull the, the prey into their mouth to feed. And so two different types of um, pteropods and two very different methods for finding their food. All right, so last of the taxonomic groups that we're going to cover today are protists. And with protists, they um, are not easily categorized. And so they're single-celled or multicellular eukaryotic organisms. And again, like I said, they can't be classified strictly as either a plant or an animal or a fungi. So they don't easily fall into a single taxonomic group for that reason and they can be found anywhere containing liquid water, so our oceans, um, or, or some freshwater bodies as well. Um, and in the oceans, they exist as uh, types of plankton. And so what we're going to cover with protists today is talk about three phylums in particular um, within protista that are animal-like, and then that they're heterotrophic and get their food by consuming other types of organisms. And so the first one is forams or foraminifera. And so they secrete a skeleton of calcium carbonate and the designs can be quite beautiful and symmetrical. Um, they're common in um, a, a, a common type of plankton, excuse me, and a relative of the amoeba. And they can range 
from 30 micrometers to a few millimeters in size so you could you can see some of them with the naked eye and um, they have contractile pseudopodia uh, that stream from their body wall and that helps them to trap food particles and so they're usually bacteriovores um, or sometimes they could be photosymbiotic and so um, this is just another way that they're able to um, sustain themselves and then they are able to form deep into the sediment um, typically along the sea floor and then next we have radiolaria and these two also secrete a skeleton but this one made out of silica and sometimes the designs can be quite ornate as you can see in this image here and they occur sing either singularly or in colonies depending on the type of species and these are also a common type of plankton that can range in size from 50 micrometers to a few millimeters um, and some of the radiolarians that I've seen in samples I could definitely see just with the naked eye and they have a membrane of pseudochitin that separates the interior cell from the exterior cytoplasm and they also form sediment deep within um, or form sediment deep in deep sea from skeletons and then lastly we have ciliates and so ciliates are common types of plankton that feed on bacteria and other types of smaller phytoplankton and so this sometimes makes them mixotrophic and they can they have more of an like a long get body structure and they range in size from about 50 micrometers to over a millimeter in length and, and they can be covered in rows of cilia like you can see in this image here and so protists again are very unique in that they are not easily confined to a particular category and so we're learning constantly learning new things about protists and so our information um, can quickly change from year to year depending on what uh, new discoveries are found about about protists so I want to briefly talk about deal vertical migration and its importance in why zooplankton do this and how it affects um, communi or coastal communities and also um, communities at lower depths in the water column. And so deal vertical migration, to define it, is synchronized movement of zooplankton that move up and down the water column over a daily cycle. And a lot of people think that this may be the largest natural daily movement of biomass on our planet and to show what this looks like here um, I have an image of um, a, a eco sounder images that were collected using a zooplankton acoustic profiler and this is a type of active sonar system that both transmits and receives acoustic or sound signals underwater and by doing this, we can actually kind of visualize um, aggregations of, of whatever actually really is, um, is sitting in the water at depth. And so what we see here, if we look <clears throat> at the surface, um, everything is nice and labeled. So we have surface and then down below over and between 70 and 90 meters, we have an aggregation of zooplankton at what looks like probably around um, 12 a.m. or so and as we get towards um, near dawn we see that the aggregations of zooplankton start to move up in the water column so the trigger as to why this is occurring um, can be a change in light intensity which is probably the most likely trigger for deal vertical migration um, and then also changes in depth are associated with um, could be associated with cloud cover or eclipses phases of the moon um, all these fluctuations in light basically intensity so like light plays a significant role in how zooplankton travel up and down the water column and as you can see over a period of about 12 hours the zooplankton are near surface most likely feeding on phytoplankton and then as the sunlight dissipates over the evening or the afternoon 
the aggregation of zooplankton go back down to depth and reside there throughout the night and then starting the cycle over the next day. So there's different types of deal vertical migrations. Um, there's nocturnal, one period of maximum biomass in surface waters at night. There are twilight, uh, where two periods of maximum biomass in surface waters at dawn and at dusk. And then there's reverse uh, DVM, which is one period of maximum biomass in surface waters during the daylight. And so with deal vertical migration, um, the range of what this occurs at could be between a few centimeters or more than 25 meters. And what we could see in the previous image is that it definitely was uh, in a much larger range. And some of the uh, reasons why zooplankton might or perform deal vertical migration is to perhaps reduce predation by fish and other predators that require sight, or I'm sorry, require light, so they're sight feeders. So the zooplankton will stay at depth during, to, during the day to avoid predation. Other reasons could include maximizing growth efficiency, uh, reducing interspecific and intraspecific competition in grazing, and DVM plays a large role in the act of transport of dissolved organic uh, matter to depth, so we're talking about the biological pump, and what that is is that it's the conversion of CO2 and inorganic nutrients by phytoplankton during photosynthesis, as well as the cycling of calcium carbonate. So when zooplankton are going up and down the water column, they are um, eating the phytoplankton, so thus ingesting the CO2 that has been um, that has been converted by the phytoplankton, and as well as creating fecal um, pellets that drop in the water column, and all of this falls down into um, different depths of the water column, which provide nutrients that other marine organisms need in order to survive. And so DVM is a pretty important process, and um, hopefully maybe someone in the future would be interested in diving deeper, no pun intended, into expanding on why this is uh, of an important role in our um, ecosystem and why zooplankton are encouraged or have adapted to perform this. Okay, so now that we have covered some ground on what zooplankton are and getting a basic introduction, um, now we can start asking some questions about how can we study zooplankton and for as long as people have been curious about the natural world scientists have been trying to answer this question and different themes that we can start to think about um, in terms of how to study zooplankton might include diversity abundance distribution or behaviors and the next couple of slides, we're going to go ahead and dive into different examples of what current grad students um, and past grad students have worked on to better answer how can we study zooplankton. First up, we have Ben Whitmore, and he studied zooplankton predator prey interactions, and typically, um, Sample collection is done by using a large net, whether it's a bongo net, um, and in this case for a lot of samples that Ben had looked at, it was collected by using the mock nets. And the mock nets is a multiple opening closing net and environmental sensing system, that's the acronym for mock nets, and it collects uh, zooplankton at different depths in the water column, and then these samples are brought back to surface and are preserved. And so um, th while this is a good way to look at the different types of zooplankton that are at different depths, it's not the best way to observe how far apart organisms are, and it makes it almost impossible to study zooplankton predator-prey interactions. So instead, what Ben had done, instead of using a net, he helped come up with the idea of using a high-resolution camera called the Zocam and uh, that is attached to an unmanned submersible that glides through the water very slowly, about four inches per second. So this is called the Zoe Glider. 
And here we have two different images of the Zoe glider in action. And as you can see, the Zoe cam is attached at the bottom here, <clears throat> or at the end of the Zoe, the Zoe glider. And the submersible um, can stay, goes on deployments between 14 and 30 days. And the types of metadata that are collected from the Zoe glider would include depth and time, so that allows Ben to get a better picture or tell more accu accurately how far apart the zooplankton are. And so with that metadata, when he um, is able to um, pull these images from the zoocam, he, he can see where the predator and potential prey are um, in a much better sense than if we were just to collect it with <clears throat> with a net. And so in this image here, we see that marked in blue, uh, what looks like a ketognath perhaps, and surrounding it in the red circles are its potential prey items, which are most likely different types of copepod. And this is giving us a much better picture and representation of the amount of prey available um, in, in relation to um, the different types of predators that are within the water column. <clears throat> Another um, benefit of using the Zocam is that it generates these amazing images that have a lot of detail. And the difference between these images and the images I'm going to show you with the, with the Zo scan that I use is that the Zo glider is able to capture the zooplankton in um, their natural posture, which is really important. So it gives us an, a better idea of what the different zooplankton look like naturally versus when they're preserved in um, formalin. So next up we have um, Stephanie Matthews and she studies zooplankton in the mesopelagic part of the ocean. And so here we have Stephanie here looking at something at the microscope, very classic. And so um, mesopelagic zooplankton, which live in the deep ocean between 200 and 1,000 meters, are fairly small and are advected by ocean currents. And so they're usually eaten by pelagic fish, such as tuna or mahi-mahi. And again, Stephanie also uses the mock nest to collect samples and also with the mock nest data such as temperature, salinity, oxygen, and fluorescence is also gathered. <clears throat> so what Stephanie does is that she uses DNA sequencing to identify organisms present at each location. And this is important because it can um, help her identify the different organisms that were sampled. And uh, Stephanie does prefer this method over microscopy, which I, I totally understand. And DNA analysis allows her to work with other scientists that are doing sample collections in different parts of the ocean and compare um, and see what the diversity looks like. And so here we have her looking at, they're getting the mock nest set up for deployment. And her ultimate goal is to map the distribution of zooplankton, um, map the distribution of zooplankton species in the mesopelagic ocean, so that she can understand the what aspects of the environment are important for the zooplankton survival. And so, if she can create a database that includes many different species with metabarcoding, then she can. Um, help other researchers as well identify the different the ab abundance and diversity of zooplankton in the ocean. Okay, so now we're at the part where I talk about what I do. And so I use the ZooScan to scan and catalog uh, um, organisms that were collected at sea um, using different types of nets. And so in order to actually get those samples, I have to go visit Lindsay down. At, she's the Pelagic Invertebrate Collections Manager at Scripps. And um, I gather my samples from her and take them back to the lab. And basically I, what I do with each sample is I split the sample based off of size. And then from there, I take an aliquot um, of the different size fractions and put the aliquot on the scan and disperse it so that none of the organisms are touching each other. And that's important because if the organisms are touching each other and you go to scan it, it'll make it 
very hard for me to separate and manually sort the images later. And so as you can see here at the bottom, these images um, are very um, detail rich. And if you were to zoom in on a raw image, um, you could really see a lot of um, characteristics in the different zooplankton. And making sure that they're not touching it helps me better see the different characteristics and identifying them. And the images that are produced using the ZooScan are quite beautiful, actually, and again, full of detail. And um, they kind of give us a better image or a better idea of <clears throat> what some of these smaller zooplankton look like. And sometimes what we might do is we compare ZooScan images with um, images captured from the ZooScan or ZooCam as well. And so what I want to show you quickly is a video, uh, like a very simple time lapse of what I do in the lab. So here's my glamorous face. Just kidding. So what we see here is just me walking around, right, using the Zo, uh, the Zo scan. And so I have to use a step stool to get up there because I am on the shorter side. And though this is not may not be glamorous work, it is definitely necessary work. And so by Scanning images um, from these different samples collected out at sea, we're able to get a snapshot of the abundance of and diversity of different types of, of zooplankton that are collected um, from different parts um, along the Santa Barbara Basin and other parts of the ocean. So it's, it's good work overall. Hey, we are near the finish line. I'm sure you guys are ready to exit out of your web browser. <laughs> and so before we wrap it up today, though, um, I just want to encourage everyone to please help spread the word about marine biology at home. And if you know someone that would like to contribute or you know someone that maybe would like to expand more on a specific topic that they have seen, um, in our videos here, please go ahead and send them over to our Facebook group, Marine Bio at Home, to get more info and to figure out how to contribute like that. And so thank you everyone for your support, for continuing to stay interested, for asking questions and being present. Um, sometimes it can't be easy because given the current situation, a lot of us are stuck at home. So let's try our best to try to stay engaged with one another, to check in with one another, and to continue um, awesome research in the sciences and to report back and, and tell other people about what we've learned. And again, thank you to everyone for watching this video today. Um, I hope that it was informative um, enough to generate some interest for yourself and learn more about zooplankton and the oceans in general. Um, thank you to everyone that um, contributed information for this lecture. And I hope that everyone has a great and fantastic day. See you later.